Hi, my name is Josh Solomon. I'm an associate professor of medicine at National Jewish Health. <clears throat> and I was invited to talk about post-COVID lung disease and specifically about post-COVID pulmonary fibrosis. In 30 minutes, we're gonna talk about the data that exists on the lung disease after COVID, most commonly uh, scarring fibrosis, but we'll also cover briefly airways disease and uh, pulmonary embolism. So let's start with a case that we saw at National Jewish. This is a 74 year old woman. She was admitted to the hospital COVID positive with evidence of lung involvement. She quickly developed ARDS and was on a ventilator for 17 days. She was proned uh, until her uh, PF ratio was greater than 150 based on clinical data. And she received low tidal volume ventilation throughout her uh, time on a ventilator. She was treated at the time with dexamethasone and remdesivir as that were, those were the medications we were using at that time uh, based on current data also. On admission, this was her CT scan. And as you can see, this scan shows patchy bilateral uh, ground glass and some consolidation. Uh, this is a typical acute COVID pneumonia scan. And, and for those who are unfamiliar with these terms, when I say ground glass, I'm referring to the areas on the scan that have uh, uh, that are fuzzy, but you can see through them. And the consolidation is defined as an infiltrate in the lung that you cannot see through. So this patient has both of those commonly seen in COVID. And then... After recovery, the patient got a follow-up CT scan at two months time, and you can see that uh, some of that acute, those acute changes have uh, gone away, but the patient still has some of that uh, increased density, that ground glass in the background, and now has some of these dense white lines um, called reticulation, and these are reticular lines, and then this is this ground glass in the background. So the CT scan has not cleared up by two months. At seven months follow-up, we can see that this is a relatively clear scan, but does have some a small evidence of articulation, which is again, fibrosis, um, but, but majority of that has resolved. So let's cover some background before we talk specifics. COVID-19, as you all know, was um, started in December of 2019 in Wuhan, China. Since that time, and as of a few days ago, there have been 222 million cases worldwide um, and about four and a half million deaths in Vietnam. Uh, I know Vietnam started with very few cases, but now has about a half million cases total with 13,000 deaths. And in the United States, we've had 40 million cases and 650,000 deaths. Well, those of us who take care of patients who have COVID-19, I'm sure you've noticed this, we really noticed early on that even though patients recovered from COVID that we were seeing them afterwards with respiratory symptoms. Um, and there was an early on, there was a suspicion that there was a lung disease that uh, was associated with the recovery from COVID. So we'll briefly cover acute lung involvement um, in, and th these data are from China as well as United States. And I'll, I'll put references in, in all these slides if you're interested in the, in the articles. Uh, about 14% of people who are symptomatic with COVID uh, develop some evidence of lung involvement. So that's uh, either shortness of breath, they breathe fast, their oxygen is low, or they have uh, infiltrates on their lung, in their lung. Uh, about 5% of people who have symptoms uh, get sicker uh, and develop either respiratory failure, septic shock, or really multi-organ dysfunction. So there are a lot of asymptomatic cases, but those who are symptomatic, lung involvement is, is not uncommon. This is again, a scan of acute COVID lung uh, we have these, what we saw earlier, these areas, these patchy areas of, again, what we call ground glass opacities that you can see through these. Here's another one. Here's a small section. So really very common with acute COVID is uh, patchy areas throughout the lung of ground glass opacification. Uh, I want to point out one of these signs that we're seeing a lot of in acute COVID. This is called the halo sign. So the halo sign is an area of consolidation that's surrounded by ground glass. Um, before COVID, this was really common. Uh, we saw this a lot with hemorrhage. This is also a common appearance of aspergillosis. Tumors can look like this, Wegener's, fungal infections, and tuberculosis, but we're seeing a lot of this from COVID. So uh, about a quarter of patients will have that. We've known for a long time that uh, the viral infections can cause fibrosis. So if you remember SARS-CoV-1 uh, breakout in 2003, 
there were about 8,000 cases worldwide. It had a higher mortality rate, so about a 9% mortality. That's higher than what we're seeing with this outbreak. Um, but in that outbreak, uh, about two weeks into the illness, we started noticing the patient had reticulation. Again, those dense white lines that are indicative um, of, of potentially indicative of fibrosis. Um, and, and though ground glass opacities improved in many patients, half of them had these reticulations at four weeks. Um, and if you looked at those who had exercise intolerance, over half of those had fibrosis, averaging about 36 days after admission. And common to what we're going to learn in COVID that this fibrosis was seen more commonly in the elderly, those who were in the hospital longer, and those who had higher LDH, so higher inflammatory markers. In addition, MERS, which uh, had an outbreak in 2012, uh, less patients got MERS, thankfully. It was about 2,500 cases worldwide, but it had a 34% mortality. So this was a much uh, higher mortality rate with this virus. If you looked at patients who were about a month and a half out, a third of them had residual reticular row opacities on their, on their imaging. And again, subjects were older, they were in the hospital longer and in higher LDH, similar to SARS-1. And if you look, um, I'm not showing you the data, but there's similar findings in influenza and in H1N1. So viral pneumonias definitely can cause um, some lung injury that persists after patients in clinically improve. So when we talk about post-COVID lung disease, um, it really depends on how you look for it, just like everything. If uh, it depends on the population you're studying. So if you scan everybody who had COVID, you're gonna get a different prevalence of disease then if you scan those just with symptoms after uh, recovery. It also depends on how sick they were. So if you scan patients who were outpatients, you're gonna see a lower prevalence of disease. And if you scan patients who are in the hospital, a higher prevalence. And clearly if you scan people who are on ventilators, you're gonna see more disease. And then it also depends on how soon after the infection you're looking. So if you look nine months out, you're gonna see less disease than if you look one month out. So a lot of the studies that have come out um, have looked at their varying populations uh, at varying time points. So it's not as easy to get a, a really a clear picture of what the prevalence of this disease is. We noticed early on also there are clinical phenotypes um, of patients who have post-COVID lung disease. These phenotypes, uh, the most common one is obviously they have chest radiograph abnormalities as well as symptoms, but there are clearly people who we're seeing who have abnormal imaging who are asymptomatic. And then we're also seeing people who are coming in who have shortness of breath, but have a normal chest radiograph. Those are the, the third group is the most challenging um, because uh, you have to really dig further to find out the cause of their breathlessness. So what is the etiology of what we're seeing? This is a, we're guessing that it is some combination of these three things. Is it just the fact that they have lung injury with ARDS? Because uh, is it the fact that they're on mechanical ventilators? usually for more than 14 days, or is it directly related to the virus? And I'll show you a little bit of data on those three. We know, have known for a long time that people with ARDS will get lung fibrosis. When you see ARDS fibrosis, uh, typically does what we see in this scan, which is fibrosis in the anterior um, uh, sections of the lung, uh, probably because patients will uh, spend a lot of time on their back the upper parts of the lung are the lungs that get injured most commonly because those are the lungs that will be hyperinflated because the bottom parts of the lungs are atelectatic. Um, but they, we see fibrosis in these patients. Surprisingly, there's not a lot of literature uh, looking at ARDS and fibrosis. I imagine there will be now, but there's not a lot. Um, this is a nice paper down that I referenced down the bottom. The, these patients will have restrictive physiology. If you look at their quality of life, the patients who have fibrosis will have a worsened quality of life, and it really does predict outcome. What we do notice with ARDS is that at a year's time, we'll still see functional abnormalities in pulmonary function tests, but a lot of the uh, radiographic abnormalities will improve. We also know that ventilators cause lung injury. So potentially this, what we're seeing is just the uh, consequence predominantly of the ventilator. So when you're on a uh, mechanical ventilation uh, using positive pressure, um, you get lung injury. So you get hyaline membranes, similar to what we see in uh, ARDS. You damage the bronchial epithelium. You also get this increased alveolar capillary permeability. So really, a, uh, so a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So this is all related to the ventilator. And we do know now that with COVID, um, they actually have more barotrauma. So more trauma from the ventilator. 
um, than patients who have ARDS that's not from COVID. I think that this, uh, is this real? I don't know. Um, we're having trouble uh, oxygenating patients with COVID. So we are using high, sometimes higher ventilator pressures, but um, ARDS trauma to the lung uh, from the ventilator is, is common in COVID. So maybe this is a contributor to what we're seeing. And finally, and I think this is probably the most interesting um, uh, part is, is it from the virus? And now that we're doing pathology on a lot of patients who have died from COVID with lung involvement, we know that the virus is in the lungs. So here on the left, this, these are type two pneumocytes in the alveolar space. Um, and if you look at these arrowheads, these are virus particles uh, inside, uh, inside of plasmic vacuoles and plasma membranes. So the type two pneumocytes have virus in them likely causing injury. So maybe this ongoing injury is uh, causing uh, this lung disease that we're seeing. And then on the right here, this is uh, some brown uh, staining of the viral spike gene message. Um, and a lot of cells are staining predominantly type two pneumocytes also. So we, the virus uh, is in cells in the lungs and maybe that's contributing. How much of those three different um, uh, issues contribute most? We don't know. Maybe it's a combination of the three. Maybe it's some ARDS when they get put on a ventilator, it's worse, and then some direct injury from the virus. So let's talk about what we're seeing, and I'll show you some pictures. So then, and then again, I um, we have recently uh, published a review article that has all of this in it, um, and show is updated as of about a month ago. So uh, if you're interested in that, I can make that available to you, and I'll reference that. So post COVID lung, uh, two to four weeks. After hospitalization, we can see reticular abnormalities, again, those white lines at two weeks in a third of those with COVID lungs. So that's significant. So a third of patients who are recovering will have evidence of lung damage with reticular abnormality. And then at four weeks, half of them will have persistent abnormalities without improvement. And at four weeks, we're seeing a lot of septal thickening. We're seeing, still seeing the ground glass that we see in the acute setting. Um, and if you look at patients who are hospitalized, 75% of them have PFT abnormalities. And the most common one we're seeing is a diffusion capacity that's reduced. So for those who are unaware, diffusion capacity measures how well uh, gases uh, go from the atmosphere into the lungs. And we're seeing that is reduced in, in a three quarters of patients uh, who um, uh, were hospitalized with COVID pneumonia. So this is a typical case. And again, I reference at the bottom of our review article, this is acute COVID pneumonia. Again, this is the third time I've shown it. It's very typical patchy ground glass is what you're seeing in your hospitals. And then if you look uh, over a month later, uh, a lot of that ground glass has gotten better, but what we're in, but you still have it. See, these are patchy areas of ground glass, right? Consider this to be normal lung. Uh, so this is obviously wider than that. So this um, are areas of patchy inflammation. And then you're starting to see potentially some articulation down there. Um, but mostly it's ground glass um, and it persists. So what happens at three months? When you look at three month scans, 40% uh, of patients uh, who had an abnormal scan during their hospitalization have residual disease. So in over half of it went away, but it persisted at three months, that's a long time. And if you look at this study that I'm, I'm quoting here, a quarter of those patients actually never went into the hospital. So they had abnormal imaging, they weren't sick enough to make it into the hospital, or at the time of the pandemic, we didn't have room in the hospital, but uh, they still have changes at three months out. Uh, and at three months, you're still seeing ground glass as the most common manifestation, but you're also seeing some subpleural parenchymal bands, and I'll show you um, I'll show you an example of that. And that really is more indicative of fibrosis than the reticulation. Reticulation, we can see improve. The things we're gonna consider fibrosis are really architectural distortion. So when you have traction bronchiectasis or honeycombing or these subpleural parenchymal bands possibly represent fibrosis. And if you look at patients who are on ventilators, you see fibrosis in two thirds of those patients. Again, this is at three months out. Um, and uh, you know, there are some question whether or not these abnormalities were in different areas of the lung. They really are in areas of previous inflammation. So the areas that had ground glass, those areas turned to fibrosis. These are not, we're not seeing these in areas of lung that did not have infiltrates in the initial acute setting. So here's a scan of someone at three months time. And you're seeing these bands of uh, these white lines that are bands. This is a, a subpleural parenchymal band 
This is uh, some evidence of fibrosis, but again, you're still seeing these areas of patchy ground glass. They take months to go away in these patients. So, you know, obviously we don't have two year follow up, um, but we do have a couple studies with longer follow up. So, here we see at four months, if you're intubated, you still had abnormalities in, in 75% of these patients. Um, even if you weren't intubated, half of them had abnormalities. Uh, and again, this is uh, fibrotic changes. So, you're starting to see the fibrotic the things that are more consistent with fibrosis later on at four months. And then at six months, 35% uh, of those who had severe COVID pneumonia, and that's defined as on oxygen or ventilated, had fibrosis. And then now we're seeing the features of fibrosis we're more familiar with, traction bronchiectasis and or honeycombing. And a nice paper was just published in radiology by uh, Caruso and colleagues that looked at post COVID lung six months out. Um, and they looked at 118 patients who had moderate to severe COVID and they scanned them at six months and 72% uh, had fibrotic changes. Um, and so we're looking at, here, you can see these scans, right? You see a lot of this infiltrate. Um, and then you're still, you're seeing here some these subpolar bands and reticulation and, and some architectural distortion here. And so you're seeing evidence of fibrosis and what really predicted what was how sick they were when they were in the hospital, as well as quantitative CT. And we're going to talk briefly about that uh, towards the end of this talk. But again, fibrosis persisting at six months. We should have 12 and 18 month data soon, but we don't have it yet. So a question comes up a lot about the patients who have persistent ground glass that really doesn't improve. It, you know, I showed you data on patients who have gradual improvement over time in their ground glass opacities, but we clearly ha are having patients in our hospital who are a month out from their infection who have persistent ground glass opacities. Um, these have been, people are starting to write, um, write papers about these patients and doing some case series. Um, and if you look at some of the pathology or some of the, um, that is associated with these ground glass opacities, there are reports of this either being organizing pneumonia. So organizing pneumonia is a lung injury pattern that is recoverable. So it's when the lung gets injured from multiple different etiologies, their infection or aspiration, um, or even associated with an autoimmune disease. It's an injury pattern that resolves. And so we're seeing that in some of these patients. And then there's also a, a rare entity called AFOP, which is acute and fibrinous organizing pneumonia. That is a more severe fibrotic type of organizing pneumonia. It's a little more like, um, like ARDS, it's closer to ARDS. And so we're seeing some of that on pathology also. Um, if you look at these patients, a third of them will resolve in one or two months, but you have patients who don't resolve. And so I have treated many of these patients in the hospital with steroids. And there is now some data on using steroids in the patients with persistent ground glass opacities. I referenced one of the studies here, which is nice. It came out recently um, showing that steroids may speed resolution of these. This is an example of a patient who's a month out. You can see the septal thickening down here. These arrows are septal thickening and there's also some persistent ground glass. And then what we're seeing a lot of also is something uh, that is very striking. It's called the ATOL sign. So A-T-O-L-L, -L, the ATOL sign. And this is a great example of that. What that is, is as you can see, is very well demarcated ground glass. And so really these sharp lines that, that kind of separate ground glass from normal lung, this is the ATOL sign. And again, these patients are, have persistent inflammation and we are treating them with steroids and if they require, um, if they steroids for a couple of weeks, but if they persist or they slowly improve, I will transition them over to agents such as mycophenolate or azathioprine, which are steroid sparing agents to help mitigate or not have the long-term side effects of steroids. Let's talk about a couple of the minor manifestations. So airways disease, we don't really have a lot of information on this, but we're seeing it. It's hard to know if this is airways disease that patients just had before they got COVID, but they didn't know. Um, but it is, and it was reported, if you look in so the original SARS-1 outbreak, uh, there was reports of post-COVID airways disease. So if there's any suspicion for this, you have to do expiratory films. And so when this is an expiratory film, you see a bunch of areas of this air trapping. So, right, they exhale, most of their lung loses oxygen, uh, loses air, oxygen, and gets more dense, but there are areas where they traps air and that air trapping um, is darker on CT. And so when you look and you see that expiratory air trapping that's suggestive of airways disease, how to treat this, we don't know. 
Um, but we're seeing some of it. We're looking for it. And then obviously the one uh, obvious one that you really have to pay attention to is post-COVID pulmonary embolism. There's been a lot of talk about um, increased thrombosis in patients with COVID. This is a nice review um, from the Journal of American Heart Association looking at why these patients get more thromboembolism. Uh, and, and it's some combination of the inflammatory process in the lungs plus interaction of the virus actually with endothelial cells. And there's a lot of um, things that go on in, intravascularly that lead to um, thrombosis, activation of these pathways. Um, and in, in the acute setting, we're seeing a lot of, we, you all know this and you've read about this, we're seeing a lot of blood clots. So um, in hospitalized patients, up to 15% will have a DVT and pulmonary embolism up to 16%. But if you look in the ICU and you look at all patients, you can see PEs very high. And then this one series that was recently published, they found pulmonary emboli in 50% of patients in the ICU. So in the acute setting, we're seeing a lot of this. Um, how long that this, um, this propensity or this, uh, how long uh, does this, this hypercoagulable state last? I don't think we know, um, but I, you have to really consider that in patients who are recovering from COVID, potentially they have the risk, ongoing risk for pulmonary embolism. And so I really think you should be looking for pulmonary embolism in patients. If they are short of breath, you do a CAT scan and you don't see any parenchymal lung disease have a high consideration for pulmonary embolism. Also, in patients who have uh, isolated reduction in that diffusion capacity. So when your DLCO is reduced by itself, that sometimes is a marker of a pulmonary embolism. So really, you gotta be thinking about this and looking for it because these patients need to be anticoagulated. Again, an example from our article, this is uh, evidence of a patient with a PE in their right intralobular pulmonary artery. This is a patient who had recovered from COVID. This is their CT scan. So you see a nice, you know, you see persistent infiltrates as we've talked about, and but you see a nice wedge-shaped infarct in the periphery that goes along with that PE. And then the most worrisome part about this is that when you, we image that patient months later, when the PE is gone, they still have, it's hard to see, but they have these non-occlusive webs in their pulmonary arteries. So here is an example of it suggestive of chronic thromboembolic disease. So possibly even after the PE resolves, these patients have ongoing uh, thrombosis. Um, and obviously that's a big concern. So I think we don't know about what to do with this currently. I, just what I do, and I'm, I'm making this up because I don't know, when patients get put on anticoagulation in the hospital, normally we would stop that at three months if they are young and uh, uh, have an unprovoked PE but we're, I'm keeping it for longer. Um, I'm keeping it for, for longer than three months. This also was just published um, by Remy Jarden and colleagues. Um, this is looking at dual energy CT. So dual energy CT looks at how substances behave at different energies. Um, and you can look at ventilation and perfusion and get a really a good picture of what's going on in the lungs. This is a study in 55 patients who were symptomatic after COVID pneumonia. Um, and 5% of them, they found just a blood clot. So uh, patients who there was no suspicion for a PE, they found PE in 5%, and this is three months out. But 58% of them had defects in perfusion, uh, so, which is quite scary. Four, four of those patients had normal lung parenchyma. So if they have, they have these defects, and this is an area of a patient who didn't have a pulmonary embolism, but had shortness of breath and has a, a perfusion uh, defect, suggestive of microvascular abnormality. So not a big clot in a larger vessel, but small vessels that are not functioning or have webs. And so uh, we're, potentially we're seeing a lot of this um, perfusion deficits that are related to ongoing, uh, potentially small clots or in vascular thrombosis. So really uh, concerning three months out. So I think potentially anticoagulating these patients for longer is what we should be doing, but we don't know. Quantitative CT, um, is where you do computer quantification of changes on a CT. We know that, um, that early in the course of infection, it predicts in the, in the acute disease, predicts ICU admission and mortality. Um, we also can see the quant CT changes decline over time. But the question is, is are we gonna see, can we really discriminate long-term fibrosis with it? Uh, at our institution, we're looking at something called DTA fibrosis, which is just one of these techniques Dr. Humphreys, who works with me at National Jewish, is, um, is leading this charge. And we're looking, 
at patients who've recovered from COVID. Um, we're measuring fibrosis and, and the quantitative CT is very sensitive at measuring changes in fibrosis over time. So really a good way, not only to quantify the amount of fibrosis, but to look at how it changes over time. So what are the risk factors? I, I, um, I put a lot of them here because a lot of risk factors have come out in the literature um, in many different articles. And again, I will uh, summarize those in that, in that review article. Um, some of these make a lot of sense, right? If you need to be on a ventilator, you probably have more fibrosis. If you are hospitalized, if you have a lot of disease in the beginning, if you're older, right? We know that patients who are older tend to be more fibrotic in the lungs. That's why a lot of the fibrotic diseases we see like IPF are more common in the elderly. Um, but some of these other ones are, have to do with the amount of inflammation you had in the acute setting. So if your CRP was high, if your IL-6 was high, um, you know, so were you more inflamed when you were sick? That leads to more fibrosis. Men get it, potentially get it more commonly. I'm not sure why that is if you're a sicker person. So I think uh, the more we read, we're learning about a lot of risk factors. I, you know, you have to, it's hard to determine risk factors because you can imagine there's a lot of confounders you have to control for when you're studying this. And I'm not sure we know exactly what the true risk factors are, but we're looking. And hopefully we'll have an, uh, be able to tell people when they're in the acute setting that they're at high risk for fibrosis long-term because then we can talk about treatments. One of the other risk factors that was recently identified is just interesting. Uh, if you're familiar with interstitial lung disease risk factors, there's a mutation in, in telomerase um, uh, that is associated with IPF. And so in familial IPF, so IPF that runs in families, this fibrotic lung disease, you can see these mutations in 15% in of them. Um, we also know that the, the length of your telomeres and your DNA that uh, are associated with survival. Um, and when you look at telomerase length in patients who have uh, survived from COVID, this, and this shows this as um, the higher, uh, so uh, when your, your telomerase length is independently associated with fibrosis. Um, and, and I think that's significant. So potentially uh, there is a genetic a predisposition to fibrosis and something we need to learn more about. Because again, predicting fibrosis is what we really want to do so we can potentially treat that. Now talking briefly about treatments, if you look, uh, there are a lot of treatments being investigated. So the, in America, we've got a website um, that looks at all the clinical trials going on. Uh, it's called clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, and you can go to that website and just put in the word COVID and you'll see all that. There's a lot of trials, as you can imagine. I wanna mention two of the anti-fibrotic trials. So we have drugs that stop fibrosis in the lungs. And obviously these would potentially work in these patients. So nintetinib, if you're familiar, it's also called OFEB is the brand name in America. It is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that clearly reduces fibrosis in patients who have um, IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and other types of lung fibrosis. So this is currently being studied in these post COVID patients. So they're looking at giving these to the patients who were in that early phase before, after they've recovered, before they develop fibrosis. Um, and again, if we could predict who those patients were, we could, um, we could target those patients with treatments. And then this genistein, which is an agonist of uh, estrogen receptor beta, it's also uh, looking at, it's also can mitigate fibrosis. And so it's also being studied by uh, the National Institutes of Health in, in America. But these are two of, of a lot of studies looking at um, how to prevent fibrosis in these patients. So I'm gonna end on some soft recommendations. When I say soft, I mean that these are not, these may change, but currently based on what we're seeing, these are our recommendations uh, that in a month, they may be different. As you know, uh, COVID, uh, uh, the COVID recommendations change frequently as we learn. But uh, my recommendation is that if anyone comes after they've recovered from COVID, if they have um, respiratory symptoms such as breathlessness or even a cough that won't go away, I do think a, a, a CT scan of the chest is warranted. If you can do a high resolution CT, that's best. That's the thin cut uh, CT that gives us a best look at the lung parenchyma. If you don't have high resolution CT, a normal CT would work. Um, I wouldn't use contrast unless you think they have a pulmonary embolism. So if you're just looking at the lungs, we get a better look with non-contrasted scans if there's any consideration for a pulmonary embolism, and as I mentioned earlier, I would have a low threshold to look for that, um, think about giving a contrasted CT scan. Um, and uh, if you have these persistent inflammatory infiltrates, ground glass opacities, uh, 
Um, I would consider using, after you've ruled out infection, I would consider using immunosuppressive agents. Um, as I, when I've given a lot of talks in Vietnam, I always say the same thing. Don't use steroids for a long time, right? They should not be on steroids for six months. You will run into a lot of problems. Treat them briefly with high dose steroids. If it works, uh, you have many drugs in Vietnam you can use to replace the steroids to treat them long-term. Those are azathioprine and mycophenolate. Um, to be honest, if you don't have those two, you could even use methotrexate as a steroid sparing agent. Those would work. Um, and then I would say outside of the drugs that we are, we have some data on like steroids, uh, and the drugs that we will know about, I would not rush to use any drugs without good trials, good clinical data to support them that you probably heard that we've tried a lot of drugs in COVID, um, that have Plaquenil and Ivermectin, these drugs that we don't have any data to support. And so I would, um, wait till there's proof before we use things in these patients. I don't think we should be experimenting on these patients. So in conclusion, uh, post-COVID lung disease common, uh, especially in those who are hospitalized who are put on respiratory support. Um, likely most of these changes we're seeing resolve over time, but some of them will persist. Patients can have inflammation, fibrosis, airway disease, or uh, pulmonary embolisms. And though treatments are not established, immune, suppressive, immune suppressions may help with the inflammatory lung disease. And with that, I'll end um, and I will be on live and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.